If you love a prodigal, you can discover help and hope for your wilderness journey right here at the When You Love a Prodigal podcast, and also help and hope for your own life journey. Today, we have a special guest, a former prodigal. As my friend Daryl Smith tells his story, be sure to jot down anything he shares that will help you on your wilderness journey with your prodigal, such as understanding what contributed to his choices, ways you can communicate better with your loved one, what helped him turn around. Daryl is from Chattanooga, on staff with Crew, where he worked with high school students for quite a while, and now serves with his wife, Gwen, as director of Oneness and Diversity for Crew. I first got to know Daryl when he was director of the Crew High School Ministry in Chattanooga. My daughter, Michelle, was in in college nearby and for two years served as a part-time intern staff working for Daryl. I love the way he helped her and all his staff to try out different ministry opportunities, to discover their strengths, and begin to shine in those strengths. He was a great team leader, which he has demonstrated as he has taken on greater and greater responsibilities in crew. So let's talk with Daryl. <laughs> Hi, Daryl. Welcome. Hello. Hey, Judy. And I'm glad to be here. Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to you as well. And um, I'm glad you made it in with the flight things the way they've been. So I think we'll just start with letting you tell a little of your story, um, who you are, where you're from, your family. Yeah, uh, Judah, as you said, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I grew up in a, a single-parent home. I s- grew up in government housing. I'm the youngest of five. Uh, I have uh, brothers and one sister. My oldest brother, uh, Judy, he was uh, killed in a car wreck. I'm so uh, sorry. He had stole a car. The police was chasing him, and he went through the windshield uh, when he wrecked the car. Uh, but we grew up in church. My mom made sure we went to church. Uh I played Joseph in the uh, Christmas play and learned my Easter speech. I sung in the youth choir. And so part of my upbringing of my background was a spiritual background, but also with all the temptation and the challenges of the world growing up in, in government housing, there was a lot of things, other things to get involved in, even though my mom, who loved me, wanted me to know the guy who loved me and who died for me. So as you were getting older and experiencing the temptations of the world, <laughs> um, did the spiritual have an impact on you then, or was it just what you did on Sunday mostly? I would say that was a consciousness, Judy. I knew, I can remember even doing things and praying and asking God to forgive me and God help me. But I thought that I had to do it all on my own. I would ask God to help me. Now I need to straighten up. I need to fix myself. I needed to stop my bad behavior and start my and start good behavior. And Judy, I didn't have the strength to fight against the temptation. So I end up giving in to a lot of the temptations, especially as a teenager. Sure. But a very good thing happened to you when in your latter teen years when you met Gwen. Uh can you tell us a little about your relationship and meeting and dating and getting married? Yes. Yeah, so, Judy, one of the temptations for me was uh, sexual activity. I had a child when I was a teenager, not by Gwen. So I have been very involved with in relations, unhealthy relationships uh, as a teenager. And uh, through one of those relationships, there was a child born. And it didn't work out for the young lady and I. And then I meet Gwen, and Gwen was different. She was saving herself for marriage. Gwen uh, had—she was brought up in the church. She would say she was religious. She wasn't saved. But moral behavior was was important to her. Even though, Judy, I was like, that's interesting and different. 
<laughs> but I was attractive to it that she was saving herself for her wedding day. And so we began to date, and I promised her the world. But, Judy, you, in my upbringing, even though there was some foundation, I had never seen a, a, a model of a family. So I didn't know how to be a husband. I didn't know how to love Gwen uh, the way Christ loved the church. And so it brought a lot of challenges because we married when I was 19 and she was 18. I joined the military and we married. So were you then separated because you were in the military? Uh, she joined me four months later. I went to basic training, AIT, and then when I got stationed in Fort Hood, Texas, she came with me to live with me uh, uh, in Fort Hood. In, in Texas, yes. In Texas. <laughs> <laughs> My my audience knows that, you know, they hear about Texas fairly I, often. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little about your life. There was this good influence with somebody who wanted to be a, a moral person, and yet w there were activities that you were engaged in that were probably pretty risky. Yeah, so Gwen and I, it's interesting. We get married. She moved to Fort Hood. I have no model of marriage, but what I what I did know, I was supposed to go to church. And Gwen had grew up in church, so in the military, we would go to church. We 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 sought out a church, we found the church, we would go to church. But I would say I wanted enough Jesus to get me through Sunday, but not too much Jesus that He was going to transform my life. And and that was our life. That was our marriage. Uh, there was a lot of challenges. I wanted to hang out with my friends and drink and party and, and then go to church on Sunday. <laughs> and That's not uncommon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so that was the military life. And eventually, because of uh, the challenges of me being married but wanting to live a single life, Gwen decided that she would go back to Chattanooga. So the last year that I was in the, in the military, I was there by myself. And Gwen went back, she got a job and got an apartment for when I transitioned out the military to come back to Chattanooga. So when did you get involved with drugs? Well, I, I came back to Chattanooga and God blessed me. Judy, I would have never said God blessed me because at that time, the uh, UPS, they were you had to be part-time to be a full-time driver. But they were interviewed once every two years, people off what they call off the street. So they interviewed 300 people and hired two. I was one of the two that they wow. hired as a full-time driver. And my mom was still living in government housing projects. And Gwen and I was married. And I would use this language, Judy. We was American poor. I grew up in financial bondage. And I wanted the American dream, so I would be I would go visit my mom and a lot of the guys I played football with, sports with, were still living out there with their mom. They was young adults, and they had chose the lifestyle of a drug dealer, and they was making a lot of money. And so even though God had blessed me with a job, I wanted more uh, of the American dream, and I wanted to dream it on Monday and wanted it to be a reality on Tuesday. So I engaged in that lifestyle, and Satan rewarded me, Judy, with killing, stealing, and destroying people's dreams, their goals, young ladies who uh, cheered for me, guys who played sports. I destroyed everything in their life by selling them uh, crack cocaine. And Gwen, I hid it from Gwen as long as I could, and she found out. And again, not a believer, but uh, religious activity was still part of her life. She was still going to church. Moral excellence was part of her life. Uh, and so she didn't want no part of that lifestyle. And it caused tension in our marriage. And I became bitter at Gwen because we was born in financial poverty. Now here's a way for me to get us out. We're going to get everything that the world say will make you happy. We're going to have cars, clothes. We're going to be able to do. And not only did I destroy people lives, Judy, I destroyed my marriage. And so Gwen and I legally separated, and eventually we divorced because of my lifestyle. And then you became even more involved in your drug dealing? Yes. I have never used drug. For me, it was a business. I was I was a businessman, and I would go to Atlanta, come back, and distribute the drugs to people. But, Judy, I, I, I would never forget. I remember laying in my apartment. I'm divorced. I have my own apartment, one bedroom, 
and I'm praying. I'm asking God to protect me. I'm asking God to forgive me. Everything that I knew, I knew it was wrong, but I was justifying wrong. And because I was in a community where wrong was the norm, I was able to justify. But night after night, not every night, but I can remember crying out to God and asking for forgiveness, and I'm sorry. God, protect me. Really, I wanted God to give me the loaves of bread and fish. I didn't want him. I just <laughs> wanted more. Jesus said, you didn't seek me because you wanted me. You sought me because I, you was hungry and I fed you. And so I wanted protection f- from the Lord, but I didn't want the Lord. And what happened? Well, God answered my mom's prayer. My mom had been praying that God would protect me, protect me in my foolishness, and God did. So your mom knew what was going on. Oh, yes, she knew. She knew. And I remember, Judy, she telling me, Daryl, when your, when your money run out, your fun going to run out. You're looking, you're looking for peace, but you, you, you're trying to find happiness, but you really want peace. And she wasn't an educated woman, Judy, but she didn't know theology. She didn't know Hebrew or Greek. But what she knew, that the God of creation loved me and wanted a relationship with me. And so she would tell me, and I would get mad, Daryl, I'm praying for you. And I'm like, why are you praying for me? I need money. I don't need prayer. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, Judy, but God answered her prayer. On, on September the 21st of 1990, I was stopped on the interstate coming from Atlanta back to Chattanooga, and I had over $20,000 worth of drugs, uh, 4000 in cash, and two automatic weapons. And not, a, not one person could have told me that was God's protection and God answered my mama's prayer. But God was rescuing me, and he was starting the process. Seeds that was planted. The Bible say one plant, another water, but God give the increase. Seeds had been planted. Seeds had been watered. And God was going to put me in a physical prison to set me free from a spiritual prison. He was going to give the increase. I love that. I love that. So you did go to prison. Yes, I went to prison. I'm divorced. I'm in prison. Uh, I'm facing 30 years. Eventually, I'm sentenced to 10 years to serve for Judah, I feel like a failure. I done lost my job, which was a career-paying job with UPS. I done lost my family. And now I'm in prison. So what I'm thinking about is, do I want to live? Is life worth living? Should I just end my life? And then it come over on the intercon or something. I get something. There's a, a, a spiritual service. There's a Christian service I can go to. And because I had been brought up in church, I was not afraid uh, against spiritual conversation. There was a young man who reached out to me, Judy, in prison, and we are real good friends now. He was in for murder, and he had became a believer, and he shared with me the four spiritual laws. And this is what I told him. All of the stories are not success stories. Starting out, I told him, I don't need Jesus. I need a lawyer. Do you know a good lawyer? But God kept working in my life, and I would go to worship service. And, Judy, I would go. And really, my motives was wrong. I wanted to go so God would get me out of prison, and the warden would see me as a good person so I can live a life. But God's motives was that he loved me. Even though my motives was wrong, God loved me, and he was drawing me into himself. No man come to the son unless the father draw him. And, Judy, in my prison cell on, on um, March 11, 1991, I fell on my knees, and I loved the old hymn, and heaven came down and glory filled my soul. I can remember saying, Jesus, Lord, I have tried everything. I have had money. I have cars. I have had clothes. I have had fun. If there's Jesus I keep hearing about, I keep reading about, the one that my mama told me about, if he's real, I need him. Judah, in the prodigal son story, it said, and when no man gave to him, he came to his senses. God put me in a place where no one can give to me so I can come to my senses. And I said, I want to go back home. That's what the son said. And I didn't say it in that type of language, but I, with tears running down my face, I asked Jesus to come in my life. I didn't want moral excellence anymore. I didn't want religious activities. I wanted a relationship with the one who loved me and who died for me. That's beautiful. And the way God does it. Yes for so many people. And I'm sure for our listeners, uh, that's where a lot of them are. 
They they grew up understanding a lot, knowing a lot about the Lord, but hadn't really come to that relationship. Or even if they had, they decided they could do it on their own. And yet you're saying, no, you couldn't do it on your own, and you didn't really have that relationship. And God pursued you. Yes. And he rescued you. But you are still in prison at that point. What happened? Yeah, I'm still in prison. And, Judy, I, I, was, I was a lot younger and a lot, lot slimmer, and I loved sports. So at that time, I'm playing basketball I'm every day. Now I'm a believer, and I fall in love with God's Word. I pull back on the sports. I'm sitting in a corner, and I'm just reading the Scripture. Uh, there's no plane to catch, to go speak. There, there's no devotion to do. There's, I'm reading the word because for the first time I know, yes, Jesus loved me. This I know, for the Bible tell me so. Didn't know Greek, didn't know Hebrew, was no engagement. So I wasn't studying the word for a talk. I was studying the word because I wanted to know him. And I began to just grow. And I'm sure I wasn't rightly dividing it. <laughs> but God was God's gracious. okay. Okay. Yeah, he's okay with that. Uh, he wasn't giving me a test. Uh, he was revealing himself to me. And in that, God began to speak to me about his intent for Gwen and I, the marriage, that he had never intended for us to divorce. Judy, what I don't want the listeners to hear, that if they've been divorced and they didn't remarry the person, that that, that they miss God. For, I'm saying for Gwen and I, this was God's will for us. So God began to speak to me that he would have us to reconcile. And so out of uh, obedience, I called Gwen and told her what God had told me, and she kind of laughed and said, you got me once, you won't get me twice. If you're a Christian, I see you in heaven. And Judah, I understood the hurt that I had caused. I had caused a lot of hurt and pain. Here's a young lady who grew up in a single-parent home, dreamed of being married, probably playing with her Barbie dolls and, and having weddings and, you know, the American dream life. And her, what was a dream became a nightmare. And I had caused a lot of that pain and that hurt uh, doing that. And so during the three-year process that we was divorced, my lifestyle was very reckless. I was a prodigal. When the Bible talk about the things, of the prod- I was that, that guy. And Gwen was still preserving herself, honoring God. And so I'm talking to her, and she knows some of the things that I have did. And she said, Darrell, I can't do it. And but the same guy who was speaking to me started speaking to her. And when she tell a story, she said she was driving because she had went back to college to get her education degree. And God was speaking to her and she pulled over crying and hit the steering wheel and said, God, no, he don't deserve me. And God said, you don't deserve me, but I love you and I need you to love him. And so God brought me out after serving right at three years of the 10 year sentence. That must have been a miracle. That was a miracle, Judy. It, it, when the, I got a, the paperwork saying that you're going to be released on March the 6th of, of, of my birthday. It's March the 6th. And I didn't believe it because I was like, this is, this is a mistake. And so I had my sister to call the parole office to make sure. And they was like, yeah, we, we, see, no, we see no reason to keep him in prison. And I didn't know God was working behind the scene. And so he brought me out, and Gwen and I kept the same wedding date. We remarried March the, we say August the 28th of, of 92. We had married August the 28th of 84. So we kept the same wedding date. And, Judah, the interesting thing, when I asked Gwen to remarry me, she said she needed to watch me for three years and see if I was going to. It was my faith, Jane. Because she was wondering if I had jailhouse religion. And I can remember looking at Gwen and say, Gwen, you're going to have to marry me by faith. If God has spoken to you and has spoken to me, we need to remarry by faith. Because in the 35th year, I can lose my mind and do crazy stuff. People, you know, and, and Gwen, against all odds, Christians, family, they counsel her not to marry me. And, and Judy, she married me by faith. She obeyed God instead of the other voices. And I see those tears. What a gift. And a gift especially from God. Yes. That he not only did a lot of things for you, but he he spoke clearly to her. Yes. And revealed to her the things in her heart. For the first time, Gwen said, Dara, 
you were the only problem in the, in the, in the marriage. God showed me how I was not the wife that he would have me to be. And yes, what you did was doing was more colorful. But if this marriage is going to work, I need God to work in my heart. And Judy haven't been without challenges, you know. God forgives some sin leaves scars. You know, in the prodigal son, it say he went to a far country in the King James. It don't tell us how far he went, Judy. But we know sin will take you farther than you want to go. I'm I'm convinced that there's people who love their sons and daughters where sin have taken them farther than they wanted to go. And not only did it, it didn't say how how far he went to get to that country, it didn't say how long he stayed. So sin not only take us farther than we want to go, but it keeps us longer than we want to stay. And then he said he lost everything in loose living. It cost us more than we wanted to pay. And that's what happened in my life. Sin co- took me forward and I wanted to go. Because I thought I would just uh, dabble in some things and, and be okay. And then I ended up staying a long way longer. And it cost me everything. My family, my reputation, everything. It cost me my freedom. But God redeems all that. And he, let, he allowed me to come back home. Praise God. So then things began to change. You all were married again, and uh, looking to what you were going to do with your life, you, your your great uh, money earning hadn't really panned out too well. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, where did y'all pick up and start moving forward with the Lord? So I get out, we get married. Gwen is a believer now. She 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 have had an encounter with Jesus. She wasn't it wasn't just the Luke eighteen, the moral excellence in the in the religious activity. She knew Jesus. She was in a small church with about twenty five people, and remember, I grew up in church, so I'm in a big church growing up. I'm used to the big choir, and the preacher got uh, charisma. And I'm in this small church, and the music is terrible. And but the I'm in a small church. Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> but the you know, and you got to drive the church van. You all the stuff that come with being in a small church that I wasn't used to. But the pastor was teaching the word. He was teaching line up on line, precept on precept. And Gwen wanted me in that church, and he started discipling me. He Praise started. God. He started discipling me and started teaching me how to rightly divide the word and was teaching me the foundation truths. And he said, Dara, you'll never know how to rightly divide every scripture. But if you get the foundation truths down, you'll know when somebody wrongly dividing it. And so he taught me and and, and, and was giving me opportunities to teach in the church. And I didn't know, Judy, that God was preparing me to be with a large global mission organization. You know, I'm preaching in this seven people back at evening service and uh, we, he wouldn't. The pastor wouldn't use the word that he was developing me, uh, mentoring me. He probably say he was discipling me. But so now I'm growing, and I'm growing to love Gwen, and he's helping me. And and we both get career paying jobs. I get hired as a convicted felon. The pastor told me not to lie on my application. I get an interview. I share the guy. Say, I'm gonna give you a second chance. And that's redemption right there. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't wouldn't have knew that word at the time. I've known that word. And for Gwen and I, both inner city kids, Judah, with our jobs, we bought our first house, was the major thing. And we bought our first new car. And we are going okay. We're in church. We have, you know, a good life. Not a you know, we live in the American dream. And God interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my way home from work. I'm working third shift and I get home and I lay down and the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow me to sleep. And the Holy Spirit said, I need you to make a difference in the community for your father, the father of light, Jesus Christ. And I share that with my pastor and he's excited and everything, but I don't know what to do because I don't know anything about missions. So I start working in the church, working with the youth, take them to the skating ring, bowling alley, Gwen and I. And I'm at work, and I share with a pastor, you pastor, about my passion to reach inner city kids. And he said, so do you want prison ministry? I said, no, I want prison prevention. I want to reach teenagers before they go to prison. I don't want them to go through what I had to go through. And so he told uh, Campus Crusade for Christ at the time, the high school ministry through the venture, Young Life, LCA, and nobody called me. Nobody called me. I was a convicted felon, had been in prison, 
Uh, it's gonna be hard to raise support. And the guy, Jim Hines, who was the director of Chattanooga, he when he tell the story, Judy, he said he threw my number in the garbage after having it for a month, and the Holy Spirit said, call him. He called me, we met, he told me about Campus Crusade for Christ, and he started talking about the Great Commission. And it registered with my heart. Because Judy, I knew what it meant to be lost. But I knew it would also meant that the world saw me as a loser. And Jesus came to seek and save that loss. And I was I, I wasn't thinking about a profession. I was thinking about my passion to reach people who didn't know Jesus. And here was a platform, and he told Gwen and I that we both would have to leave our jobs and raise support <laughs> support. And Judy, we, we we know how to be passive aggressive as Christians. So we grinned and smiled and nodded and got in the car, to be honest. And laughed. And laughed out loud <laughs> and said, if this white guy think we're going to quit our jobs and go beg people for money, he have lost his mind. Judy, I get home and I start reading the scripture. And the just should live by faith just jumped off the page. I went and shared with Gwen. I think God is in this. And Gwen looked at me, Judy, and i never forget. She said, Daryl, I'm willing to follow you as you follow Christ. Just make sure you follow in Christ. And we stepped out. That was 27 years ago. And we've been missionaries with crew for 27 years. And we're God, so glad. God have taken two inner city kids, one that was a prodigal, redeemed him, put his spirit in him, and have given us the platform to take Jesus all over the world. Judah, it's not because we're good. It's because God is faithful, and he answered the prayers of my mom. My mom couldn't fix me, but she prayed for me. I want to say to your audience that's to listen, don't try to fix them. Pray for them and allow God to do a work. Awesome. So give us a little understanding of what you were doing as you then worked with the high school ministry. So when I first started, I would go on a campus. So I, I was assigned to a local campus in Chattanooga, and I would go and win Bill Sin. I would try to win lost teenagers. Gwen and I did it together. And so we was working with young men and young ladies. Uh, we would try to win them. We would do outreach. We would do peace outreach. We would do 100 uh, banana split. We would take girdles and put bananas and ice cream in it. And they would come to an outreach and we would uh, share the gospel, and we would collect the cards, and then we would follow up with students. And so we were, after winning them to Christ, we tried to uh, build them in their faith. We would disciple them, pour into them, help them understand the spirit-filled life. And then we wanted to send them back on campus because we knew that one day it was possible that we couldn't go on campus, but the students could go on campus. And so we wanted to win kids, build kids, send them back, get them plugged. Part of the building was getting them plugged in the church. Gwen and I had grew up in church, so we believed that the local church is part of God's plan for the believer. And so we wanted to honor that. And, Judy, I have married kids uh, who said that our marriage was a model for them. That's so redemptive. It's, yes. That's just so redemptive that the thing that was not true, that your marriage was not okay at first, and yet God redeemed it, and it became a model for these kids who would have the same temptation. Yes, and and because of the school I was working in, 95% of the kids probably was in single-parent homes. And so we was the first. I can remember a teacher calling us in the office, and I think, let me say, in her room, and I think we're in trouble. You know, because we're talking to kids about Jesus, and with tears in her eyes, she said, I'm so glad you're all here. For some of these kids, y'all are the first black godly family that they have ever seen. And keep doing what you're doing. And, Judy, you don't get involved for, for those kind of accolades or those You do it no. because you love people. And Gwen and I, the Bible say, he who has been forgiven much, love much. I was loving students because I knew how much I had been forgiven. And that love, that love was compelling me. And, Judah, I don't get it right in my behavior every day. I wish I could obey God 100%. <laughs> but what I do know, Judy, that I cried out unto the Lord, the psalmist says, and he heard my cry and inclined his ear unto me. And, and, he, and, he, and he rescued me from the pit 
and set me up on a rock and gave me a new song. Judith, Jesus has given me a new song, and I have to keep singing that song over and over again. I got to be like David. I got to remember his benefits and never forget his benefit who pardoned me of all my sins and uh, who rescued me and all of those things in the midst of wanting to love Jesus and love people. I need to experience the gospel myself. I don't just need to share the gospel. I need to experience it in my own life. (laughs) Well, obviously— God has enabled you to do that a lot and to pass that on to a lot of people. So let's talk about your family. Um, How has all this impacted them growing up in a missionary home? (laughs) Yeah. uh, When Gwen and I divorced, Ashley was three. Well, when I left, Ashley was three and Elliot was two weeks old. And so— and, well, that's and, hard. Yes, and Skeeter was not even born. And so we remarried, and now we have three. Eventually we had another child once we remarried. And, Judy, we, we have been honest with them. They know our story. They have traveled with us uh, to win a conference, uh, fall retreats, and I shared my testimony, or Gwen shared, and, and we process it with them. How, how do you feel? And uh, they grew up uh, as staff kids with us in church, and uh, one, our oldest daughter went to Christian school. So we kind of did the Christian thing. And to be honest, there have been challenges off and on with that's y'all faith, that's not my faith. And, and now I'm having to learn how to pray for them and not try to fix them. And, and that's hard because it's easy for me Judy, to extend somebody, and I want the audience to hear this. It's a lot easier to extend grace to other people's kids when they're struggling than it is your own kids because <laughs> other people's kids are not a reflection of me. My kids are a reflection, and God had to show me, Daryl, it's not about what your kid's going through. It's about how they're making you look. And you're more concerned about how the heat they are making you look than what they're going through. And God had to bring me to a place, Judy, that I had to extend them grace. And now the relationships are great. I would say they all are doing okay spiritually. Probably for a parent, I don't know if they ever get to the place. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we want them to be. And and so what I had to learn, I stopped praying that they would be good kids. And God, that I want my kids to be godly. And whatever you have to do to break them to be godly. Help me be able to endure it, you know. And and so I want my kids to love Jesus. I want them to love him enough that if he wake them up at 2 o'clock in the morning and tell them to move to another country, that they would go in the room, uh, wake their spouse up and, and say, we have to go. I want my kids to follow Jesus wherever he will lead them. That's the love I want them because that's what Gwen and I want to do. Judah, life has... Crude life hasn't been easy for Gwen and I, but we would never. I'm sure end. that's true. But we're in the center of, of, of God's will. We we are following a person, not a position, n- not, n- n- not property, but a, a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And that's what I want for my kids. Uh, my youngest son is getting married. Uh, Gwen and Skeeter. I. Skeeter. Yes, yeah, Skeeter. He's getting married uh, in March. He's marrying a staff kid. <laughs> and so we are preparing for that. The other two are single. And, you know, we having to trust God with that, you know. And I think as parents, when your kids are going through stuff, the enemy whisper in your ear, you're a failure. It's because of you. See, everything, oh, God is punishing you. You know, it's, a, it, it's because of your bad parenting, uh, those things in your life that you know, that nobody else knows, God is punishing you. And God is reminding me, that's not who I am. I'm the father who redeems. I'm the father who forgives. I'm the father who restores. I make all things new. And, Daryl, I'm making your family new, but I'm still doing the work in your life. I love that. That's very special. And it's certainly something that any of my listeners would be glad to hear because all of us are always— because we have an enemy who yells at us and or whispers, but— uh, who tells us what failures we are and how we are not living up to, quote, our commitment to God. And 
and that there are things that we've done and that we still do things mm. that are not honoring to God and not the model we want for our children. And yet that we can come back and he says, no, I'm, I forgive. I'm a God of mercy. I'm a God of love. I'm a God of redemption. And that's true for these loved ones of our listeners as well. They are struggling with their own failures and the impact that that may have had on their kids or other people that they love. Um, but to understand that that that's actually an important way that God will use their lives. If if they are seen as perfect by these who have made wrong choices, mm. then they're going to think, well, I could never be like you. Yes. Uh, well, you wouldn't want to be, really. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, and, and so that's just a, a beautiful testimony of God's redemption, of his mercy, of his grace. I just marvel at his grace and his pursuit uh, not to condemn us, not to spank us, but to redeem us and to bring us to who he wanted us to be, who he's created us to be. Yes, he loves us, Judy. In the story of the prodigal son, Judy, you remember the son said, I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm just going to be like one of his hired men. And he used language that we understand, I'm not worthy anymore to be called his son. His worth, he thought, was based on what he had done, not based on who he is. And the father, when he saw him coming, the father run and meet him and hug him and kiss him because he was his son. And they both was using personal pronouns. I'm going to go back to my father. My son has come home. That relationship never changed. Fellowship was broken. And what God has taught me with my three kids that I have a relationship with them. They are Smiths, and nothing would ever change that. There's things that they do that can break fellowship, bring disappointment to me. But the same way God redeemed me and allowed me to come back home, I need to allow them to come back home. And I need to give them a sign. God has given you and I a sign that we can come home no matter what it is, and that's the cross. I want to uh, encourage the listeners, if you ever need a sign, always look to the cross. The cross is a, is, is a statement that you and I and our kids can always come back home. That's beautiful. So I'm going to ask you about your first son, okay. just because you mentioned him, and listeners are perhaps wondering, well, what happened to him? Yes. My oldest son I uh, had when I was a teenager, and him and my the mother didn't get along, and um and I, I would use the language she kind of got, ah, I want to be careful because I don't want to attack her. But we, I didn't get a chance to see him like I wanted to see him. Let's say that. And so when he got to the B18, 19, I started reaching out to him. And we began to build a relationship uh, 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 against his mom, Will. And, and but it, it it was okay, and he became addicted to drugs. And uh, about two years ago, Judy, I get a, a text message at three four in the morning from his wife that he had overdosed. And everything, the enemy beat me up, Judy. I can remember saying, if I was in his life, I could have, I could have, I could have protected him. I could have did something about it. I kind of knew he had a drug addiction, but I probably was in denial, didn't want to believe it. And so when you're in denial, you don't try to, yeah, you know. And so I was probably in that denial, and now this reality. And, Judah, I, the enemy was telling me, Dara, you travel all over the world. You have seen teenagers and young adults come into the kingdom, but you couldn't rescue your son. Your faith is not real. And, Judah, I honestly, I wrestle with that today. How could I travel all over the world telling people about the love and forgiveness of God? But I failed as a father. And I know that's a lie from the pit of hell. But it's still something that worked with me, worked on me. Uh, 
as a believer and a follower of Jesus. And uh, I need God to help me in my unbelief. The disciples said, he did, we believe, but help us in our unbelief. God, why am I not believing that you love me? And this was not a reflection of of me. This was a reflection of church. So I don't know what I, some yeah, you know, sometimes your theology go out. Oh, yes, when the, when, it does. <laughs> when, when, when you're experiencing something. And, and so... Uh, very hard for me. Gwen walked through it with me and uh, loved me through the process. That was shame and guilt. Uh, how do you show up at the funeral? Don't know how I'm going to be received at the funeral. Uh, I have eulogized hundreds and hundreds of people I grew up with. And now I'm at a funeral that is my son. And I don't even know if I'm welcome to be there. And, uh, was not enough money to bear him, and, and Gwen and I decided that we would participate in that. And we called the funeral home and said, we are not, because usually whoever pay for it get the, was like, nope, let his mom make all the decisions. We just want to be a part. And Judy, what I didn't know it was going to do, people who knew what was going on came up to me, even the funeral director called me in the office and said, I have seen people fight at funerals. I have seen so many disagreements but I seen you model Christ. What you was able to do is just supernatural. And Judith, that's to the glory of God. That's not because, because I know that was a mother who, she had lost her son. Yeah. And the last thing I wanted to do, Judah, was make it about me. Yeah. I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted her to be comfort. And even though the relationship was not, we are not in a good place and probably never will be. And I have to be okay with that before the Lord. Uh, but it, it was a hard journey. It was a hard process. And this is what I say that, you know, God forgive our sins, but some sins leave scars. And and and, and, and every now and then the, the, the scab come off. And that's what happens in my life. I was a prodigal. I'm back restored. But, you know, I was in that hog pen. I was doing all the things the prodigal and so and, and sometimes the enemy bring those things up, and I have to keep running back to the cross. And remember, there's nothing, nothing that can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Praise God for that. That um, in the redemption, there's still sometimes the consequences yes. of the actions. Our son is— because one thing he did all the time was maneuver around at the time when cell phones were just happening and get a, a phone here, and then they would shut him down because he didn't pay, and he would get one here. And he went through a whole lot of, of cell phones, and those that hurt his credit for years and mm -hmm. years. And he says, I am still paying the price for decisions I made back in my prodigal years. Mm. And and so that's a, a little example. Yes. Yours is a much more uh, challenging example, but it's, it's the truth. God doesn't just wipe the consequences away. Sometimes he does, mm -hmm. but he doesn't always. Yes. And he lets us, maybe there is a reminder of what we've been forgiven and what we've been saved from. Mm. Um, but... Uh, I told you then when I heard about your son, and I would say it again, I'm so sorry for that loss mm. because that's uh, it's hard. It, it is. And yet, you know, the father, in a sense, lost his son Amen. in order to pay the penalty for our sin. Amen. And so any last words you would have for our listeners? I would encourage you to not lose hope. In Luke 18... Jesus says, he tell a parable that people should always pray and not give up, not lose hope. I want to encourage you to not pray. Cry out day and night. Cry out day and night. We should never question God's ability. The God we serve is able. He is but able. If, <laughs> but if he don't, we still are going to walk with him and trust him and be obedient. And the act of obedience, if you have a prodigal right now, is to cry out on their behalf and pray for him. And so, Judah, I would encourage them not to lose hope. Don't faint, some versions say. Always pray and not lose hope. And when the Son of Man come back, he'll find us being faithful because we'll be crying out to him. Thank you, Daryl. We're um, really grateful 
for your coming and your honesty and sharing your life and what God has done on your behalf and can do for each of us, but also for those that we love who Amen. are walking in another place than is a good place. And so I pray that um, that people will be able to keep hope and keep praying and keep loving uh, and trusting that God will do his good work, uh, even if we can't make it happen the way we want for it to happen. So thank you, Daryl, for giving us a glimpse of your very redemptive story. And um, it's I've heard your story before, but this was more detail than I had heard. And my listeners, my friends, be sure to stop and ask God, what have you said to me here? And, and write down something, a step you can take, an action step, uh, or a change in the way you respond to your, your child or the person that you've been praying for. What do you want to apply, as Daryl has shared so passionately and— um, and just so helpfully, ways that we can not uh, give up, but keep believing and keep praying. Next week, we will be beginning a series on the gifts that we can find in a prodigal wilderness. I hope that sounds a little intriguing. There are gifts in this journey. Oh, there are amazing gifts in this journey, and we're going to spend a few sessions trying to uncover them in that wilderness and see how God is blessing us even in the hard parts of this journey. You can learn how to connect with Daryl uh, in the show notes, and um, I am glad uh, to be with you and praying for you. Uh, sometimes the start of the year, which should be a hopeful time, is e even a more scary time. So may God surprise you with the ways that he's going to speak to you and through you and work in your life as well as your prodigal's life. God bless you.